my purpose is to address some issues about the formation of a composer's aesthetic and how engagement with the fundamentals of music and sound can deeply influence that process. There is such a thing as musical logic, which is based on a mix of physical factors around sound, psychoacoustics and cognition, and complex, culturally specific factors that shape the musical experience for individuals and in society. Musical logic can at times seem stupid, even willfully anti-intellectual, but in fact it functions on a level and a modality that is not primarily based in verbal language or scientific thinking. It is its own domain, and the best definitions and explanations of musical logic are always seen in the work itself. And so for myself, I have tried over time to put my arguments in musical form, the native language of the ideas, in fact. My development has come from experience as a composer, a performer, a listener and a thinker. What I have learnt and how I have learnt it have led to my aesthetic position, which itself is an organic thing and constantly transforming itself. An aesthetic position can emerge from inherited traditions, accepted with or without some modification, or it can be the result of a more conscious activity. That is, a filtering through of what is important in search of musical elements that are a kind of bedrock. Musical truth, to adapt a term from music theory. To some, my viewpoint may seem conservative, to others radical, but these critical judgments are themselves based on extraneous and often ideological thinking outside the musical domain. The nature of a musical experience varies depending on the role one has in the cycle of musical creation and reception. Broadly, there are three main roles in the professionalised and publicly experienced Western art music process. Composer or creator of musical ideas, the performer or interpreter, and listener or audience. Yet the roles are malleable. The difference between performer and composer is unclear in many types of music. At any time, a composer may be a listener or a performer. And likewise, audiences engage with music in many ways and at many levels of attention that are not just the apparently concentrated but passive role of listener in a concert venue. Further, the experience of any of the three is shaped by experiences in the other two. A composer learns much by listening and performing, as well as by actually composing. A composed work sitting unperformed has not been realised. Its information is dormant until performed and heard. Nonetheless, as a simplified model, this triangle does help to conceptualise the different ways music is experienced and brings home the fact that music is not a unitary experience but a highly varied one. The, so the social nature of the roles is also interesting. Composing is solitary and primarily an imaginative internalised activity. Performing may be solitary but is often group based and has as its basis an external physical activity, the production and communication of sound. Listening may seem to be solitary and internalised, but at its peak level of experience in a live performance, it is a highly communal and socially engaged activity. Some may see a hierarchy in the triangle, <clears throat> a composer struggling with creative ideas, the performer transmitting the ideas, the audience attentive but submissive. Yet they are legitimately specialised and interdependent roles. Each role has its distinctive character and rewards. The affective nature of music for a listener is well documented and the focus of considerable research today. Much of the research has emphasised the way the brain deals with music perception. For example, is it an intellectual or emotional reaction or a combination of both? Or precisely where does the locus of musical experience situate itself in the brain? Yet some such research can seem naive, as if the affective response to music is unanticipated and accidental. Like any of the senses, the sense of hearing allows access to strong responses. Just as, for example, a gentle touch can induce pleasure, a foul smell revulsion, or a comic sight great mirth. Why then would we be surprised to find that music, a subset of sound, can induce equally potent responses in the absence of language? Historically, in popular culture, religion and philosophy, 
Music has been perceived in terms of its affective power. Consider the following examples. Plato allegedly described music as a moral law and saw the personal power of music in social and political terms. Two centuries before Plato, Ibicus refers to Orpheus as already famous. As one of the Greek pantheon, his harp and voice seem almost to be a weapon of entrapment, able to block out the fatal lure of the siren song, enchant the underworld and tame wild beasts. Another harpist is the biblical figure of King David, who, according to the Old Testament, connives his way to power and authority with seductive music therapy, opening the heart of the disturbed King Saul. The fascinating connection of music, power and religion continues into the Renaissance, Reformation, Counter-Reformation and beyond. Consider Luther, who embraced music for its psychological power. He wrote, In summer, next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. It controls our thoughts, minds, hearts and spirits. Then the Catholic Council of Trent, 1562, which in an attempt to draw music back into a form where language clearly dominates, formulated in Canon 8 that music must avoid vain delight to the ear. Faust, the alchemist, the musician, the scientist, the black artist par excellence, emerged as real characters metamorphosed into creative ideas. Faust, as a story of individual power, seems almost a parallel story to Orpheus and David in the sense of power and expression residing in an individual and manifest in a sometimes musical way. Hardly surprising then that the Faust story became a key narrative of romanticism, individual artists shaping themselves and hence transgressing social and religious conventions. And so to the modern realisation of the fears explicitly expressed by Plato and hinted at in the Council of Trent, namely the malevolent potential of music. Music causes armies to march in time, provides a glorifying soundtrack for mass destruction, inspires nations to aggressive and jingoistic pride and fires the masses up for protest and revolution. Think of the legacy of nationalistic musical works of the 19th and 20th century, the propagandising use of popular music in the French Revolution, or the intensity of Hitler's involvement with Wagner. Hitler espoused a close and protective friendship with the Wagner clan, wrote as a young man a draft of a Wagnerian operatic epic, and purportedly carried a copy of the score of Tristan and Isolde into battle in World War I. Much of the post-war resistance of composers to engage with the affective dimension in music and the inevitable distancing from the wider musical audience which resulted from that seems to be traceable to a photo like this of Hitler, Uncle Wolf, with two of Wagner's grandsons and the implicit story it tells us. Music has become a tool of social control. Don't give a tyrant the chance. Who except the most vain composer would want to allow themselves or their work to be a part of tyranny? At least for a period after World War II, it seemed as if many composers of the avant-garde shared the view that music of a certain type can unleash forces that are socially reckless and wanted no part of that. In the post-war period, the sentimental and affective dimensions of music were a kind of taboo for many, com taboo for many composers, in part a reaction to the totalitarian exploitation of music in the preceding 20 years. Cerebral approaches to music were highly value valued in the elite following a lineage of abstract musical thought and obsessive stylistic refinement from Schoenberg, Webern and Boulez. If now we can see that a communicative musical experience would inevitably be lost in such approaches, it did not seem so at the time. Better if music is more of a science than an art then, and if it becomes expressive, confine that expression to a generalised angst. Music's power seems to have been accepted for a long time. But as a means for social and political manipulation, its development can be traced to the period around World War I. Conceptualising music as a tool of power predates its use by the Nazis. Consider the following comments by the liberal German intellectual Charles Zisserens in his book from 1926, The Influence of Music on Behaviour. In these comments he espouses a utilitarian view of music in a social context. How ironic that totalitarian anti-liberal regimes held a similar view to Disserens and his Frankfurt School colleague Theodore Adorno. Music was a means of social manipulation and control. What ominous words in his quote, re-education and human reconstruction are in the context of Hitler and Stalin. Both tyrants have since insisted on the creation of music with social value and embodying national virtues 
and then censored what fell outside that edict. Adorno also shared a view that music was a tool for social change and for ideological reasons espoused the opposite music to Stalin and Hitler. Music had become a brutal ideological battleground and is only now recovering. It's not far from the behaviourist view espoused by Dissarens to some contemporary manifestations and exploitations of the power of music in the commercial world. Music is used to placate airline passengers at the moments of highest anxiety when they land or take off, to stave off social discomfort in an elevator, to engender happy feelings that may lead to shopping excess in a supermarket, and to create earworms through jingles or advertising that burrow deeply into the mind and cement a brand's message. And in much recent film, theatre or television, music is often merely a signpost for triggering emotions, supporting mood, creating the right feel, and so on. All are implicit proof of music's power, even if they undervalue the inherent potential of music in search of a commercial advantage. Much, but not all, of music's power to move lies in its sonic fundamentals. Are we done? In this video excerpt, a sound bomb is used in an East Jerusalem street. The reaction of the children is thought-provoking. They experience fear, distress and confusion, although there is no actual physical danger, just a loud sound. It may be a normal and natural reaction to a sudden very loud sound to behave in this way, but it is worth considering how much of the reaction is instinctive and how much is learned. Babies have been known to cry for hours having been surprised by a loud noise suggesting that a distressed response to a sudden loud sound is innate. But for an adult hearing a sudden sound, such as an explosion in a war zone, the knowledge of risk may lead to a more refined but equally dramatic reaction as the adult seeks safety and takes cover. By contrast, an adult with even more knowledge, that is, one used to sound bombs as a device for civil control, may not seem to react at all. So we can see a whole series of interpretive overlays on an initial reaction that may or may not be instinctive. The reactions could be placed on a continuum, ranging from primal to tempered by knowledge to completely intellectually controlled. Surprisingly, this is relevant to music and the way it is heard, because music has both physical properties, as do all sounds, and culturally specific attributes. The physical properties of sound are widely understood as mathematically constant features. Sound consists of, wave of waves of vibration travelling from a sound source to a sound receptor, such as the human ear and brain. Although the sound waves are invisible to the eye, they are a real physical phenomena, just like light, which also cannot be touched. On their trip to being heard, they may encounter obstacles in the way, or acoustic factors which may alter the character of the sound. The journey affects the sound we perceive, as of course does the nature of the receptor. Put an obstacle between the sound and the receptor, and its path will be diverted in some way. Put the sound in a resonant chamber and it may produce echoes or other enhancements to the sound. The sound may be enhanced, reduced or transformed by its journey. Our process for receiving sound involves physically capturing the sound by the ear and transferring it to impulses which the brain interprets. 
A single sound or tone consists of an audible vibrating fundamental pitch and overtones which follow a particular and constant pattern and which are normally not audible but influence the timbre of the sound. The tone itself has four key properties and possibly a fifth. These are intensity or how loud the sound is, secondly timbre or tone colour, thirdly the speed of vibration, what we call pitch. Duration is the fourth, how long the sound lasts, and, and finally I propose a fifth, space. What we call a high pitch tone has very fast cycles per second and a low pitch sound has very slow cycles per second. High and low as descriptors of pitch are really metaphors as there is nothing literally high or low about them. We may as well call them fast and slow sounds or hot and cold sounds or even green and purple sounds. Already even in dealing with the science of acoustics a level of inter interpretation is apparent. We can hear more than one tone at once but create too many individual tones at once and what we hear becomes unintelligible although the ear seems to initially but not indefinitely search for meaningful information even in a babble of sound. So what you say we might know this we know this but I feel we take it for granted at our own risk as the composer the musician and the listener's role is fundamentally about creating communicating and experiencing subtleties of the physical nature of sound and interpreting those subtleties. Understanding the limitations of sound production and reception is also important as there are biological listening, uh, limitations to our listening. If we ignore these fundamentals, then the capacity of music to communicate is severely restricted. At key points in music history, a return to sonic fundamentals has occurred and shaped the way music has subsequently developed. We may, in the last 40 years, have seen such a move. Emerging out of the post-war European avant-garde music was a primarily American movement of experimental music. It followed a quasi-scientific methodology and engaged strongly with the potential of electroacoustic music in the 1950s and 60s. Key to the thinking of various composers, John Cage is the most well known, was the idea that music exists in multiple ways in a plural society and that aesthetic assumptions should be challenged. The idea of experimentation was important. This is the idea that a defined conceptual process should be established to create music. So a score may be a set of verbal instructions or a game-like paradigm in which music would happen as a result. The ideas were important across the arts and, philo and philosophy, even if, ironically, some of the music was uninteresting. The ideas themselves are an odd mix, libertarian social philosophy paired with a sombre scientific outlook, but they unquestionably focus attention on the fundamentals of the musical experience. The American composer, Alvin Lucia, who turns 80 next year, has a unique and fascinating approach to the concept of experimental music that is bearing on the nature of the musical experience and its relation to sound. I came into contact with him when he spent a semester at UQ in the early 1980s, where I was then a PhD student. An example of Alvin's work is a piece with the wonderful name Still and Moving Lines of Silence in Families of Hyperbolas. The concept of the piece is to show the physical presence of sound waves in a room to the extent that they are absolutely vivid experienced almost as physical phenomena, uh, as if they were visible. In a performance I participated in with Alvin, the work in part consisted of a single sustained sine wave being generated electronically from a loudspeaker whilst I sat with my clarinet. Over a period of about 15 minutes, I would play very slow, soft, long and evenly spaced notes, moving progressively by tiny increments from a semitone below the sound to a semitone above. In all, I was able to find about 10 to 15 tiny or microtonal steps to eventually go up a semitone into a unison and then as many steps above. What happened is that the sound waves produced by my clarinet and the sine wave generator, the sine wave generator interacted in quite amazing ways. As the two tones got close to being in perfect unison, the physical properties of the sound waves changed and became more physically apparent. At the point where they were slightly out of unison, the interaction of the two tones produced an extraordinary effect of beating, rapid pulsation waves of disturbed air. Quite uncomfortable to listen to, somewhat like the sound of bird's wings beating a path near your head. Then at the point of absolute unison, the sound waves moved into a beautiful parabola. As a performer, I could literally feel the two sound waves merge in and out and around me. After the concert, one of the audience, a distinguished musician, explained that she had had to leave the performance because she found the physical sensations of the sounds being created, although extremely soft, unbearably painful and nauseating. 
I would never have guessed that such very soft sounds could have such oceanic force. The sheer intensity of the experience has helped me to appreciate why for centuries so many have reverted to supernatural explanations of the force of music. Some members of the audience mentioned to me that they had found inner details and interest from the experience and found it to be artistically very rich. I found that baffling for some time as the piece was impoverished in conventional artistic terms. My conclusion, having observed similar reactions to comparable pieces since, is that the human brain will construct a great deal of meaning even where the source material does not actually possess it. The imaginative properties of the listener, in other words, are a critical part of the musical experience. Over time, my conclusions from this and other similar experiences have shown me several things. Firstly, that the physical properties of sound are almost infinitely powerful in their effect on consciousness. Secondly, shaped to a rich aesthetic experience in musical expression, the force of sound can be enhanced, but done badly, it is less than the raw sounds. Thirdly, listening is an imaginative process, not purely confined to what is being heard. Fourthly, there are paradoxes in listening. Soft can be more potent than loud, for example, in terms of affect. Fifth, there are significant inherent limitations in our hearing and listening. And finally, there are culturally specific and social influences in our cognitive listening processes that shape and even pervert the way we experience music. Our biology shapes the musical experience far more than we realise. One might even propose bioaesthetics as a new field of study. Charles Ives' 1931 exclamation to a concert audience, use your ears like men, could be recontextualised in light of this to don't use your ears like men because the human listening capacity is limited. Perhaps one day we will have prostheses to improve our listening as well as our hearing. Of particular interest to me are the limitations that we physically have in listening to music. This is distinct to limitations a listener might have uh, through lack of cultural knowledge or misinterpretations of the artistic content of a work. We have limits in our listening ability just as we, as we have limits in other activities. To illustrate, over generations, some perpetual tiny progress in the speed of running, 100 metres, may occur, but is it ever possible that 100 metres will be run in five seconds? An example of a physical limitation in listening is the fact that our range of hearing, hearing deteriorates with age. A child can hear a larger range of pitches than an adult. <clears throat> and an elderly person can hear less at the ends of the pitch spectrum than either. Hence, you may have noticed the secret ringtone phenomena. The high-pitched mobile phone ringtone an adolescent can hear, but a middle-aged parent cannot. Further, humans have a smaller range of pitch and volume hearing in their hearing than do dogs. <coughs> there are other specific limitations in the listening process that I propose. These are based on observation of others as well as critical self-reflection. I have a continuum to present here. The first examples on the left of the continuum are less contentious than the later ones, which are more speculative. Firstly, density of sound, then acuity or speed of perception, then rate of events, perverse imaginings, uh, fourthly, memory or the perceptions of shape, and fifthly, collective musical experience. So firstly, density of sound. In writing a large-scale work, Song of Songs, in 2004 for 18 voices, I noticed that at certain points in the work, no matter how carefully conceived the material was or how well the music was recorded spatially, junctures occurred where one ceased to hear multiple independent voice, voices and instead heard them as a mass of combined sounds. Captive, 
terms, I propose that we have a limit to perceiving multiple lines of counterpoint. For most trained listeners, six independent lines is a challenge, but more than eight lines is probably impossible to hear with a sense of individual lines retaining identity. When my counterpoint reached eight lines, the music lost its authentic contrapuntal sense. I had previously noted this in a famous work by Thomas Tallis, Spermenalium, famous as much as anything because it is for 40 vocal parts in five choirs. When I first heard the work, I was disappointed to find that the multiple voices could not be readily heard as counterpoint, but merged into spatial harmony. Bach faces this same problem, where the lines of counterpoint merge into a still beautiful, but rather more amorphous harmonic mass of sound, in pieces where he uses two or more choirs. Likewise with recent examples from Ligeti and Messian, where hugely dense counterpoint, which invariably looks superb on the page, is not really audible as such. This may be related to the cocktail party effect, a term used to describe, to describe our ability to hear mass sound environments and connect to single or multiple lines of interest. There is a point where the ear fails to retain focus. Two, acuity and speed of perception. Have you ever had the experience of accelerating by car past a line of intermittent solid objects, for example, a picket fence? At a certain point, as speed increases, we cease to see the individual pickets and see only a blur. We may even see what is behind the picket fence more clearly, as our perception is able to construct the image of what is behind. The brain constructs the image from tiny slices of information. It seems to be an imaginative process. My observation is that in listening, something very similar can happen. Our hearing is not adapted to separate notes at great speed, although there is no technical reason in acoustics why notes cannot be shortened and repeated to faster and faster speeds. Indeed, there is a particular tone colour one can achieve in only this way. But it is a tone colour that is a byproduct of a weakness of listening. In the following example from my journey to Horseshoe Bend, you can hear a high distant sound in woodwinds of the orchestra behind the spoken voice. The sound is rather hard to pin down and hovering like a cloud of dust. It's produced by very rapid alternations on one pitch between several instruments. At six o'clock, there was a sudden commotion in the camp. A cloud of dust could be discerned rapidly approaching. Within minutes, the shape of horses and riders could be seen in the distant dust. Mrs. Gus Elliott of Horseshoe Bend Station, accompanied by one of her stockmen and the messengers sent out the day before from Idrakaura Station. There are perceptual or physical limits to the speed of events we can process and interpret. Another example, think of the internalised repetition of a sentence you have just heard, say a punchline to a joke, and how you may need to run it back internally to, to assimilate the meaning. That process partly relies on the need for time to interpret the information, a space between the events as it were. So it is in music. An overly dense succession of material is something both our ears and brains have limitations in dealing with. That has repercussions for a composer in the pacing of ideas and even the in internal structure of musical ideas. The ear craves space and silence. Permitting space and silence gives greater weight to each sound. Reducing space and silence creates a tension which itself is of value for a composer. This is something I've tried to explore, for example, in Endling for Orchestra.
three rate of events, perversions of the imagination. Something connected to this, although not so much a weakness as a quirk of perception, is the way we cope with slowness of activity. I mentioned how in the Lucia example, listeners found artistic depth, which is arguably not there except in a conceptual way. But even more telling is the experience of observation of listeners with extended minimalist pieces, works that are often highly repetitious or slow in the rate of change of musical ideas. The ear, it seems, can create inner experiences. We tend to perceive meaning and create impressions that are not actually present. Think of a mirage or other optical illusions. The brain can trick itself into hearing more than is actually there in reality. An acute and deliberate control of the speed of ideas and their rate of presentation is characteristic of much of the most widely loved music. It's worth remembering that we actually build a perception cognitively. It's not ready-made, and the process with listening is imaginative. That's too small to read, so I've got some... Four, memory and perception of shape. In this illustration from my PhD thesis on the work of post-war Italian composer Luciano Berio, it shows the reappearance of the key organising musical idea in a solo viola work. Even in the first half of a short solo work, the mapping of the ideas is massively complex. It took me weeks to work out how it all related. The process of finding these links is not one that can be done by ear, although the ear may throw up some connections. My conclusion was that however brilliant the planning and the organisation of the piece, the musical impetus was lost because it was not conceivably trackable by ear. Our short-term observation of events and capacity for recall of these events is not adequate. Even with study, that is still the case. The result, two highly structured levels of detail are self-defeating and instead of creating engagement, distance the listener. I have had to conclude that as an artistic statement, the work is critically flawed because it operates outside of our capacity to assimilate information. Memorability of idea is critical to retain listener engagement, as is a sense of where one is within the duration of the piece. Five, the collective musical experience, group behaviour and prejudice. Well, if one listener is complicated enough, what goes on when multiple listeners hear the same piece? You might think that this is an odd question, but the collective nature of the musical experience is influential in the way we hear, compose and perform. Collective responses to music can range from extremely extrovert to completely silent, and yet either can signal a high level of engagement. The familiar spectacle of a rhythmic writhing mass at a rock concert can at times look a bit like the schooling behaviour of fish. Some sort of mirroring and collective decision making on a non-verbal level seems to occur. By contrast, sitting at a chamber music concert recently, I noticed that many of the audience were listening with their eyes shut. I think they were awake and sentient and listening in a deeply relaxed, almost meditative way. By cutting out visual stimulus, one could almost become a part of the sound and be highly aware of tiny oral nuances that might otherwise pass by. But are we more or less alone when we listen to music in a group with our eyes shut? Perhaps an extrovert rhythmic and physical response to music is achieving something similar, feeling oneness with music through highly kinetic group behaviour. To what extent does some kind of quantum entanglement or mirroring behaviour affect the listening experience? It should puzzle anyone who has sat with a group of a thousand others in a performance. Why do we behave as though one? Why do we sometimes engage almost involuntarily and at other times without any cohesion? Does the size of the group have an impact on the behaviour and does the volume of the music influence it? The brain is puzzling and the music bug seems almost addictive and viral in its effective and contagious qualities. Indeed, at times, music in a mass environment can produce disinhibiting effects, more typical of alcohol or other drugs. The nature of shared sound is powerful and wonderful. In music, style is the final frontier. Musical exploration of new ideas has led to massive expansions in complexity in all areas of pitch, rhythm and tone colour. But with a few notable exceptions, conceptually driven stylistic expansion, manipulating conventions of style, is a kind of taboo. Where a composer engages with it, it can engender ignorant criticism, as I have discovered with two large-scale works, Jenny to Horseshoe Band and Going to Shadows. Is style a representation of a kind of tribalism? Like passion for a football team, do we feel the need to belong to artistic teams? If some studies conclude racism is hardwired, do we have similar incipient artistic prejudice? 
Is our passion for group behaviour so strong that we find music a marker of group identity? Why is it when our modern experience of music is so plural that we look for stylistic uniformity in single works of music? Rationality does not govern this behaviour as reason would support the view that style is just another technical aspect of the experience of music. My feeling is that we, where we learn certain listening behaviours at a young age, we are very resistant to transgressing them later. In fact, patterns of listening behaviour around style are rather like etiquette, a very complex social formation of shared behaviour. To demonstrate lack of affinity with etiquette singles one out as a breaker of social taboos and outcasts. facets is a permanent feature of human listening and which are culturally specific. Further, which of these limitations may decline over generations? Can we improve our listening en masse? Should composers aspire to be listened to by an audience in the distant future with superior listening capacity? That would be in the same way that a composer might write challenging music whose novel performance techniques over time become assimilated and accepted as normal. For example, will our listening ever improve sufficiently to in interpret a more fast and complex rate of activity? Yes and no. We may improve individually and collectively, but there are limits of biology that preclude improve improvement past a certain point. Finally, to turn to two examples which illustrate some of these points. secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord You don't really care for music, do you? Well, it goes like this The fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift The baffled king composing Hallelujah Hallelujah Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah, does illustrate the power of simple things. Like other Cohen songs, its true affective domain is not primarily in the music. The key to the song is the exceptionally interesting and engaging way the music functions in relation to the words. Cohen's poetry is magnificent and whilst populist, has the knack of catching attention and allowing multiple levels of interpretation. Multiple interpretations are important because they trigger an imaginatively engaged response from listeners and hence a kind of personal ownership and identification. The words provide a powerful level of metaphor, echoed by music that is easy to sing, falls within a functional vocal range and constructed so that there is time to absorb the key ideas. The fact that the song's text plays on musical terminology, the major lift, the minor fall and the secret chord, is itself a level of meaning that engages attention. Art about art appeals because it makes us think in a mindful way about what we're hearing on several levels of interpretation. Play the music on its own and it's not much. Place it in its social and textual context and there is abundant expressive force. In Beethoven's Piano Sonata in E Major, Opus 109, the communicative impact, whilst bound by cultural norms, is purely musical. How fascinating that this affective piece was written by a composer who for about two years had been deaf. The piece draws on quite profound insight into mental responses to music, a highly evolved inner voice, and a physicality of performance touch or muscle memory that Beethoven must have experienced as a pianist. He hears through his fingers and through his highly developed imagination, but not his ears. 
And the music depends for its expressiveness on many of the things I have mentioned, but also the one critical thing I have not mentioned much, harmony. Harmony, or the vertical arrangement of groups of pitches and their motion over time, is the single most distinctive and sophisticated thing about Western art music and its most subtle and self-referential force. Of all musical elements, it most depends for its impact on specific listener knowledge and has bound itself by cultural knowledge. <clears throat> there are five or six particular moments in the theme and variations movement that I know to be engulfed in musical expression, so much so that I have based a large-scale work, 12 Variations for Piano, on a brief passage from this movement. Marked Gesangvoll mit innigster Empfindung, which means songful with inner expression, Beethoven's music progresses from tuneful and waltz-like sim waltz -like simplicity to a huge expressive range with double trills and passage work that teeters on the edge of losing its balance before returning to the opening theme. The movement also shows a detailed understanding of the way a listener perceives and holds musical ideas. There is no great pride or conceit in the music, no ideology or facile fashion, just a determination to pe permit creative flow and imaginative invention within a carefully constructed and well understood formal structure. Paradoxically, the structural confines that a theme and variations form ultimately serves to ensure a heightened and more original experience. There is an inner line of expressive harmony in the movement as follows in this example of edited material.
whilst we cannot turn the clock back to Beethoven in creating new work, we can observe the principles that led to the musical ideas. The technical and aesthetic principles are deeply communicative. Forget the myth of aloof musical solitude, as this is communal music that places the, the listener centre stage. It paces information brilliantly and provides structural signposts. It defines within itself what its boundaries will be. It is exquisitely inventive, especially around a hovering and alternating harmonic pattern. It teases and challenges the listener. It gives us a little more in each variation. It rotates back and forth on itself, showing how strangely circular musical thinking often is. It times, at times it slows as if to say, keep up to the listener, and then it runs ahead. These are not abstract concepts. The success of the affective dimension of the music is based on an exploration of inner listening, rather than any technical argument or intellectual device. The mastery of technical musical language is subsumed to allow an expressive and communicative end. The expressive objective is personal and internal for the listener. Musical logic is paramount in the work, and musical logic is a force derived from sound, not language. A black art, definitely not but one which exists within its own sensory domain of knowledge and communication, which words can only struggle to fully convey.